Welcome back to Missing. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing pretty well. Uh, a lot of stuff going on, Tim, and we're trying to sort it all out internally and figure out the best way to broadcast and, and I guess, communicate to the listeners. So I'm looking forward to this episode because I think we put together something pretty unique here. And today we're talking about the disappearance of Maura Murray. And recently, in September of 2021, there were bone fragments found on Loon Mountain in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, about a 30-minute drive from where Maura Murray's car was left. And obviously, this has led to countless questions and very few answers at this point. We've wondered all the things you've likely wondered yourself. Where on the mountain were these bones found? When will we find out who this is? And what about all those rumors? Right. And to get a little uh, geographic for you, anyone who doesn't know, Loon Mountain is a very popular ski resort that's located in Lincoln and Livermore, New Hampshire. And it's been frequented by thousands and thousands of avid skiers, snowboarders, hikers. I believe it's part of not only the White Mountain mountain range, but also the Appalachian Mountains. So it is traversed quite a bit. And we spoke with several people that will play in this episode for you that can address different elements of what I think we're all thinking. But mostly it's like, how did how do we handle this information? Because from Julie herself, she says it feels different. And it does. When you look at the facts of this particular discovery of bone fragments, it does feel different. If it doesn't end up to be Mora, well, it's somebody. So either way, this issue has to be addressed. That's right. A quote from Julie Murray. She said, we're still not exactly sure how old these bones are or the gender, but this one feels a bit different. And she went on to say, this is gut-wrenching. And she mentioned justice for Mora, um, if this is Mora, but also urged web sleuths and everybody not to interfere in the investigation. And they do appreciate the support, which she did communicate in a video posted on Twitter for the public. Especially now, I think this time of waiting is really tough, and and they've said as much. And we wanted to read the statement from the New Hampshire State Police that they posted on Instagram. They said, New Hampshire State Police, in conjunction with the Lincoln Police Department, New Hampshire State Archaeologist, New Hampshire Medical Examiner, and U.S. Forest Service, are currently investigating the discovery of human bone fragments in the area of Loon Mountain in Lincoln, New Hampshire, during a recent construction project. Police conducted a thorough search of the area. Investigation is ongoing and diagnostic testing on the bone fragments is pending to include determining the historical nature, age, and possible sex of the bone fragments. At this time, there is no additional information available and there is no reason to believe there is a threat to the public. As we've said previously and we continue to say, we do not know for certain who this person is. We don't know if it's Maura Murray, but as far as local missing people are concerned, there isn't another person named Dennis Robert Towell, who appears to be the closest missing person in the proximity. Dennis went missing on August 4th of 2002 from Woodsville, New Hampshire. He was 59 years old at the time of his disappearance. First up in this episode, Lance, we speak with journalist Maggie Freeling and retired U.S. Marshal Art Roderick from the disappearance of Maura Murray docuseries on Oxygen. And they were part of the docuseries. We were part of the docuseries. And we know from being with them that they did actually investigate Mora's disappearance. And they speak about how the discovery of these bone fragments will most likely be handled by both journalists and law enforcement. So it's a very interesting perspective to get from both of them. And then we speak with David Middleman of Othram Labs about the process of someone finding bones to professionals identifying them. He masterfully breaks down the science of making a positive DNA identification as well as the advanced methods Othram is capable of. And for those of you who would like to learn more about Othram, please go to Othram.com. That's O-T-H-R-A-M.com. And then finally, we speak with White Mountains local John Smith about these Loon Mountain rumors. I really enjoyed this conversation with John, one, because he provides a lot of relevant information about the area in which he lives, where Mora went missing and where the bone fragments were found. 
he's really knowledgeable in how things work up there. Also, it's a really great example of how you can have a difference with somebody and you can have a disagreement and you can have a falling out or whatever you want to call it. I think that that's pretty publicly known, but you can jump right back into it when you realize that it's time to be productive and talk about things that are going to make a difference, hopefully. And you can hear it. You like you can almost hear it in, in, in his voice when he's talking to us. You know that he wants to help. It really speaks to the support amongst the members of this community. And obviously, we need to take all of this very carefully. Again, the Maris asked folks not to interfere, and we're going to support them and ask you to do the same. Additionally, we need to fully respect the work of law enforcement. And no matter who this person is, who the bone fragments belong to, the integrity of the investigation has to be maintained. And we just ask for patience patience, patience. That's the most important part of this. This might take a long time. So please have patience with both the family and law enforcement. And first up is our interview with Maggie Freeling and Art Roderick. And I know we've said it before and we'll continue to say it. We'll continue to reiterate that the web sleuthing is appreciated and the support that the community shows is very much appreciated. But if you have anything, if you have anything that is substantiated, if you have anything that you feel is vital information to this case, to the bones. Please, this is not a time to post that online. This is a time to give it to the professionals so that they can do their job. And you can contact the New Hampshire State Police Major Crime Unit, the Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663 or email them at coldcaseunit at dos.nh.gov. Maggie, with these bones discovered on Loon Mountain, it's such a vague discovery. And I think a lot of people jump to local rumors at this moment. And uh, can you give us a little insight? Yeah, I mean, with something like this, you know, there really is no insight. I mean, we all saw that one press release. And I think that's what we're just working with. It's pretty unclear, I think, unless you guys have seen something different, if it's even how many bones, if it's really just fragments, if they have found intact bones you know the reporting there there's very little to report on and i think that's where people get in trouble because they start speculating in your opinions what 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 is owed to people who have been following this for a long time and and have committed so much of themselves to it well i think art's going to have the same answer as me but you know law enforcement doesn't owe the public anything i mean they need to keep what they need to keep close to them i think you know for sure before media finds out i think the families of those involved definitely deserve to know first. And I guess Art can take it from there. Yeah, no, I actually talked to Fred a couple days ago when him and Julie were actually heading to New Hampshire. Um, And I just wished him the best and said all our thoughts and prayers are with you guys. And hopefully this will bring at least this particular chapter to an end. But, you know, I think this all goes back to what A.G. Strelzen did Uh, about a year ago when he put a gag on all this stuff, which I think was probably the best thing to do considering what was happening uh, on the internet. And I think that's going to continue because, you know, we can speculate as to bones and blah, you know, what are those remains doing up there? You know, are they ancient? Uh, We've kind of heard rumor that they're probably within the 20 years, which fits that time frame. So really the the bottom line is going to be when they do the DNA testing. And obviously they're treating that particular area as a crime scene, but also I'm sure they're looking at all the other missing persons from from over the past 20 years, if that's the case. But if it is Mora, we can go back to what we said from the very beginning is, okay, now we have a crime scene. Granted, it's an old one, but let's see what law enforcement can get out of that crime scene because you know that could be the key to figuring out who did this to her, if it is more. And how would this change the investigation going from missing persons to uh, something else? Well, Art, I don't know if it, I mean, they've always classified it as a homicide, right? Always treated it as a criminal investigation. So it it doesn't change. It just gets a lot more intense at this point uh, because they do have a crime scene. I mean, one of the things we always talked about is it didn't look like at all that the accident site was a crime scene per se, other than a 
motor, uh, minor motor vehicle accidents. So now that they actually have some version of remains up there, um, you know, the bottom line is this is, this is somebody up there who's a father, mother, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, and they've got to determine who that individual is. And um, I think that the, the, you know, the fact that uh, uh, I'm sure the state police are sharing information and the AG's office is sharing information with the family, but keeping it very close hold as well it should be. How quickly would we have some sort of answers to something like this? Uh, I, I'm sure they put a rush on the DNA. You know, they're doing amazing things with DNA now, as we all know. Every day they're making new breakthroughs. They're able to do much more with very degraded bone and DNA. It could take a couple, three weeks. Um, or if there is some other material around there, it might be a little quicker. But uh, I'm pretty sure the New Hampshire State Police and the AG's office has put a rush on the identification uh, of these remains. And you said that this site is considered a crime scene. Is that because there's a, is it automatically a crime scene no matter no matter what when you discover the remains of a human being? Yes. Okay. Well, that's the bottom line. I mean, it's not an illegal place to be buried. Yeah, okay. When you've got a crime scene there, whether it's, you know, illegal disposal of a body or, or bottom line is you put somebody in that type of area, Obviously, somebody's trying to hide something and, you know, they're considering it as all law enforcement does. They always plan for the extreme. So the extreme here is is that we've got a homicide and this is a crime scene. And in your opinion, we've heard that the remains were likely not there any longer than 20 years. In your opinion, how would they be able to determine that? That would more than likely be a scientific call from either an Emmy or an anthropologist. You know, it's it's weird because I was just doing this in another part of the country, and you also have to look at soil acidity and what's going on that would degrade a body to that particular degree just from the surrounding soil. So that's got a lot to do with it, too, and that's where you call in the ME, the anthropologists, and they can give you generally a pretty good indication as to whether we're looking at ancient remains or whether it's something more recent as in the past 20 years. And you know, we find remains, uh, a lot of times you might find a bit of clothing or jewelry or something along that line also there too. And uh, hopefully uh, they've also found that at the same location, but uh, we're not gonna know that until they actually come out and either make a charge or get a determination as to manner and cause of death. Regardless of, if, whether it's Mora or not Mora, it's not Mora, there's still ways to tell exactly who the individual is and at least get notification to that family. You know, it's not that difficult to figure out, okay, how many missing persons are from the area or within a 50 mile radius? You know, when I had more or less talked to Fred, uh, he seemed to think it was very high up uh, on the mountain uh, because he specifically, you know, they talked about, you know, are you actually going to carry a body up there? And there's always the question as to whether she was forced up there walking herself, regardless if it's Mora or not. Uh, you still have a crime scene there. If this turns out to be Mora, I don't think it's possible to dig in those conditions in the middle of winter. And the, like February is the dead of winter up there, unless you have some sort of machine that is digging or unless you saw a construction site that was still in the process and the hole was already there that they were filling or maybe it was covered for a time when they were going to resume the work when it was warmer out but immediately after her disappearance I just don't know if it's even I don't know how that would even come to be just digging in in the middle of the winter up there what's your what's your thoughts on that you know a lot of times they'll use the natural grade of the land uh, you know, could there have been a ditch there already and they just covered it up? But I agree with you. You know, we're talking February, the middle of the ski season. You know, what was going on up there at this time, at that particular day, for them to make a determination as to, as to how that individual could have got up there. And I guess you can look up, you know, what was the snow accumulation on Loon Mountain during that time period? So we've got, there's a lot of questions here. We actually have a lot more questions now 
that we have a crime scene than we did before. So it's going to be a matter. You know, the thing that always stuck in my head was the dog track. To this day, it's like it ended there, right at that intersection. Okay, so what happened? So did she, it fits the scenario that she might have been picked up, and then we have other rumors floating around about Loon Mountain. So it kind of fits that scenario, but uh, again, we were never able to confirm anything about Loon Mountain. So the the Loon 3 is something that was discussed in the Oxygen show. Nothing was ever confirmed uh, in regards to those rumors? Yeah, Maggie, if you remember, we actually went up there uh, and stayed a couple nights and, and kind of did a download at one of the local uh, restaurants, pubs. Uh, but we also stayed at that, that lodge there uh, in the Loon Mountain area. But we were, you know, some people had heard those rumors, but we were never actually able to confirm anything we heard we heard at one point three brothers that we heard two brothers and a friend and i think the new hampshire state police at that point had had possibly followed that lead out i'm not quite sure because we're going back quite a few years here but um at this point in time obviously i'm sure the state police uh, if they have an idea at this point are dusting off a lot of those old leads and re-looking at them again Lance, I want to go back to your your line of questioning about digging in February, because I feel like you're getting to the idea that she was possibly held somewhere for quite a time. And then maybe during the off season, that's when if she was brought up there or whoever it is was brought up there because, yeah, it's busy season on a slope in the winter. It seems very unlikely to bring somebody up there and do that. And, you know, that's interesting. I didn't even think about it being actually ski season. Right. You don't think about that, anything going on in the winter, but that is like the peak of ski season. You know, it's interesting because whenever these things happen, Art, you've never really paid much attention, but you are this time. I mean, it does definitely does seem more relevant this time that it could be Mora. Yeah, I mean, who else is missing in the area within a 50 mile radius, you know? Uh, you got to look at that too. But, you know, to, to your point earlier, if it's somebody that actually works at the ski resort, then they're going to have access to that a lot more than somebody who's just not an employee up there and is looking to possibly dump a body somewhere. So if it's somebody that actually worked on the mountain, they would have access to possibly some certain equipment uh, to be able to take a body up there. But yeah, you're right. I mean, how many feet of snow are up there in that time of the year? And was it on the ski slope or was it an area off a trail? Um, where they were able to dispose of the body. So again, ton of questions and really not a lot of answers. What do we do from here? I mean, I know that there's a lot of people out there who are following this incredibly closely. At this point, if it is Mara, then, we, then we're at the point where this is strictly going to be, you know, all hands on deck, number one, but also complete radio silence because they're building a case here. They're looking at evidence. Uh, specifically the cause and manner of death, if it is Mora, uh, you know, how did she die? Hopefully they're able to determine that from the remains. It's been a long time, uh, but, you know, a lot of times they can make some sort of determination. Uh, and obviously cause of death, cause and manner sometimes go hand in hand, sometimes not. But it really, the ball right now is in the ME's camp to determine cause, manner, and hopefully if at all they can get to a time of death, uh, which is going to be difficult considering those remains, if it is more, I have been over there since 2004, thereabouts. So we just have to sit and wait and be patient. Probably the next time we hear anything is going to be if it's not Mora, you know, we might hear the identification of the body or all of a sudden an indictment is released. Yeah. And I would imagine and hope that the family knows long before that. You know, it's a wait and see proposition for them, but I'm sure they will know uh, before any of us what's happening, what's going on, what the next steps are. And then if it comes down to prosecution, you know, the, the AG's office will discuss that with with uh, Fred and Julie because the ball will be in their in their park now and basically out of the hands of the New Hampshire State Police once an indictment is filed thoughts with the Murrays. Absolutely. This is clearly an incredibly difficult time and who knows how long that they could be in limbo for waiting to know. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. 
Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Next up is David Middleman. In his own words, he describes Othram Labs and DNA Solves. What we do at Othram is we, we work on identifying victims uh, or, or perpetrators uh, from crime scenes. And we work on cases that have failed all existing methods available. So there are, there are some traditional tools that are used uh, to analyze forensic DNA. There are other tools that you might use, dental records. Uh, there could be you know, fingerprints. Um, when an investigation has exhausted all leads, traditional forms of DNA testing are failed, then investigators will come to Othram, and we operate the only laboratory um, that operates at a completely in-house kind of investigative unit from laboratory work to answers to pull genetic information from crime scenes and, and derive leads to help identify, um, you know, like I said, either a victim or, or a perpetrator um, in a crime. And DNA Solves um, is a website we built to basically chronicle that, that kind of adventure. And you can see examples on dnasolves.com of cases that we've announced. Um, really, law enforcement's announced. It's not a lot of cases, but they'll occasionally announce a case. And if it used Authram technology, we try to highlight it. So you can kind of see the kinds of cases that can benefit from what we do. Um, there are cases that don't have the right funding. That they haven't either reached priority or there isn't funding for those cases. And those cases allow us to... Um, you know, you know, we, we want to work them, but those cases, what we do is we uh, crowdfund them and um, or sometimes we get sponsorship um, and, uh, and and we use that funding to basically work cases that are solvable. They can be solved, but but just we'll never, never get there because there isn't the funding resources available. So, yeah, th that's, you know, that's what we do in a nutshell. We're we're basically a, a company that can pull information from crime scenes when all other methods have failed. And we use DNA solves to highlight those successes and to uh, raise support, advocacy, and funding for, for future cases that don't necessarily have the uh, the budget to take advantage of these newer methods. Yeah, it's awesome what you guys do over there. Uh, I feel like it's, I've said this before, I feel like it's a um, a superhero headquarters where you, you're all a bunch of uh, mad scientists working for the greater good of society. The, the superheroes are all the people that are... Uh, you know, constantly uh, sharing the cases and helping raise the support. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like we had, we had three cases announced last week. We've got another two or three announcing this week. And, um, and, and, and last week, uh, I think at least two of them or one or two of them were, were basically funded by the public. These are cases that had no funding and, and, and someone comes in and says, I want to help and I want to make a difference. And anyways, it's, it's, it's wild. It's wild. What can be done when you have like a, a little bit of genomics a little bit of technology, and then just a lot of teamwork. About the bones found on Loon Mountain, what would be the steps you would go about to identify who this was? I, I followed what's in the press. We're, we're not involved in the investigation of the case, but like everyone else, uh, have followed hoping that they would, uh, you know, obviously find the person alive and and, and and regretful that they found bones. But yeah, I followed what's in the news. In a case like that, you have, you have bones and you, and you think you know who the person is. So the first step you would take would be to do a essentially a familial match. So there's, there's a kind of testing, the CODA system uses this, it's called STR testing. And the STR stands for short tandem repeat. And so you can, you can do this kind of STR testing. You measure about 20 spots in the DNA. And there's a lot of mathematics that's been developed around these markers over the last 30 years. And if you have these markers, the way, the way they're measured is such, in such a way that it's unlikely that two people would share the exact same information at every one of these markers, um, like vastly unlikely. And, and it's, the, it's how CODIS works. When, when someone says that there was a DNA match or they found you in CODIS, what that means is they've matched these markers from a crime scene against your DNA. Now, when you have someone that's died and you think you know who they are, then you'll compare against a, a nearest relative. So you can measure these 20 STR markers in the mom, and you can measure the 20 uh, STR markers from the fragments. And if you're correct about the identity of the person, you should see what would be a parent-child match. So basically half of the markers should match. And then someone can run the statistics on that and say, look, the odds of this person not being a descendant, you know, a, 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 a child of this person are so infinitesimally small, we're going to say that we've made a positive ID. That's really how the process works. Where an advanced process like Othram would come in would be uh, in one of two scenarios. One scenario might be that, uh, that they find out that it's not a match. And, and so now, now you know it's not that person, but there's still bones on the ground. So who's, whose bones are they? 
And so that's a question that Authorum can answer. The other thing is that there are scenarios where sometimes, and this could happen with skeletal remains, but it's usually like very old skeletal remains. Sometimes skeletal remains are degraded. Um, the DNA is just not really great anymore. And when DNA gets older degrades, it goes from big pieces to tiny pieces. And if the pieces get too tiny, you can't measure these STRs. These STR markers, there are long stretches of DNA. So if the DNA breaks into sizes that are smaller than the size of those markers, you, you may not be able to measure uh, any, any, you know, the, the markers. And what you'll get is what you know forensics folks will call this a incomplete profile. And so if you get an incomplete profile, which means maybe instead of 20 markers, you just get some of them, it reduces the statistical power of being able to make that claim that this is a person. And if it becomes too ambiguous, then something we can do at Authorum is we do a different kind of testing that's not based on STRs. It's based on something called SNPs. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So it's, it's spelled SNP and, 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 it, and it's pronounced SNP. And, uh, and we, we look at tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of markers. So when you have something that's like really degraded, low quality, you could take those bone fragments, even if you can't get the STRs, and you can measure like 100,000 spots and if you have a parent-child relationship, it'll be very obvious because there'll be hundreds of thousands of markers to cross-reference. And if any one marker is missing, it won't matter when you have that many. So those are kind of your two strategies that you can employ to make that positive ID. Do you plan on uh, reaching out, maybe throwing your hat in the ring on on this one to to help out? Or is that something that law enforcement or family would contact you about? How does How would that process work? I think the the next step is to is to again take advantage of the existing STR um, testing process. That's something that public labs do a really great job of. So let them do that. Now, if if it was determined that they could not use STRs to make the identification, at that point we could reach out. But also, I'll tell you, a lot of agencies already know about us and they generally come to us. So when someone comes to us um, with a case, they've either come to us because they tried CODIS and got no match which is the most common reason, or, or they, they're, they're trying to make one of these like one-to-one -one comparisons and they've struggled because the, the quality of the DNA, they can't get the right you know, quality of DNA to be able to do the testing to begin with. So we're happy to help. I think they probably would know about us already, but we, may, we might reach out, but I just feel like you got to let them do their, do their part first, right? And it's always easier if they can do it in-house using their existing tools. We're a small lab and we don't have infinite capacity. And so we're trying to focus on cases that have no recourse, cases that will sit on the shelf literally indefinitely until um, until a advanced method can be employed because all existing methods have failed. How quickly would something like this be turned around? So from a scientific perspective, you can do STR testing very quickly. I mean, you, you could do it in a week. So some, sometimes you have access to laboratories that can turn an answer around very quickly. Sometimes if it goes to like larger state-run labs, there could be a backlog. I don't know the rules at every lab. Like I don't know if they have like a kind of a fast track or not, but I can tell you this, there are private labs um, that we've worked with before that'll do STR testing uh, on contract for uh, public agencies. And, and we've had them turn answers around in as fast as three days. STR testing is a very, a very simple but powerful method. It's well vetted, it's got 30 years of science behind it. Like I said, a lot of good math that can tell you with a lot of certainty that this is a person that you're looking for. It's accepted in the court system. You know, it's accepted by medical examiners when they, when they have to uh, make a decision on a death certificate. So it really is the, the perfect first step. And, um, and hopefully they have access to resources that will allow them to do that testing very quickly. And, and if it does not work out, then, then there's, of course, other ways to get it done, including what we do at Authorum. Hypothetically, if there was hair found, would that help in the process of identifying the person? Yeah, of course, of course. And so if you have hair, what can be done, at least uh, with the existing framework of tools, is sometimes you can derive what's called the uh, mitochondrial uh, marker, uh, mitochondrial marker information from that hair. It doesn't positively identify someone, but it can tell you, um, you, it can rule out whether someone's the mother or not, or, you know, in the same family group. So sometimes they use that test as well as a consistency test. If you have the same mitochondrial haplogroup, the two of you have the same mitochondrial haplogroup, it doesn't prove that you're brothers, but, but, you know, if you didn't have the same mitochondrial group, it would guarantee you couldn't be brothers because you couldn't have come from the same, you know, female. And so, so there's, that's another kind of test that the folks can use in the forensic spaces. We can process hair as well, but I'll tell you, um, we've been hard pressed to find 
and I don't, I don't want to challenge you guys to go find this case, but we've been hard pressed to find bones that we can't uh, make sense of. Most of the bone cases we've gotten, and some of them are old. You know, one, one, one case we got it was 140 years old, and we were able to get good DNA from these bones. So unless something was done to the bones purposefully, like there, there are some, some, sometimes people, you know, will, will treat the bones chemically or like they'll boil them, like in a, in a, in a, in a, if they're doing anthropology, this would not apply in this case. Sometimes you can, you can purposefully destroy the DNA, but I would say bones generally are a pretty good source of DNA. And so I'm, I'm obviously very optimistic, but hair is a, hair is a surrogate as well. Hair is more hit or miss. It's a little bit harder to work with. And if you want to get more markers than the, just those mitochondrial markers, it definitely requires some advanced technology that I, I don't think is accessible to law enforcement right now, at least through their existing um, public laboratories. Did you just say that hair is not as good as bones when sampling? Hair is harder to get, you know, full sets of data from than, than bones. Unless, unless you've got like a lot of hair and they all have roots and, you know, like rootless hair is definitely a big challenge. Uh, individual hairs can be hard. If you have like, you know, it just depends what you mean by hair. If it's like a huge clump of hair and there's like, you know, the scalp is like, obviously that's, that's a great source of DNA. But if you're just talking strictly about hair, hair, um, I think, I think frankly, the bones are, are, are a good source of DNA. Uh, hopefully they get it to work from the bones. And if not, hair would be a good backup. I always worry, especially with hair, if you don't have a lot of hairs, it's like, are you sure it's that person's hair? You know, could it have been a transfer? So the probative value is always something I worry about with hair cases. When you said that you weren't certain if law enforcement has the current capabilities or technology, you're saying that in the sense that Othram does. Yes. So what I was saying is that generally for hair, unless you've got the root, like the full root or like some kind of tissue around it, if you just had hair, it's like rootless hair, it's incredibly challenging to build that STR profile we were talking about. So it's hard to make a positive ID with someone on like rootless hair. What you can do is you can get the mitochondrial markers and you can, you can show consistency with the family, but you can't really definitively prove something. And so the alternative is then to develop, you know, this other kind of marker set that's tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of markers. And we've done that from hair. Um, and, 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 and frankly, there's others that have as well. Um, the guy that made this famous is uh, Ed Green out of uh, um, UC Santa Cruz. He, uh, he's been able to solve cases using, you know, small pieces of individual hairs, no root, nothing. Um, remarkable stuff. So, but this is technology that I would say is more cutting edge. And that's why I said, I, I don't think it's accessible within public uh, crime labs as of yet, but there are private companies that can offer that service. Anyone that wants to follow the work we're doing or see what it can do or help us fund the next case, I would I would ask you guys to to check out DNA Solves, S-O-L-V-E-S.com. And you can, you can click cases and there's a little drop down to see cases that are not funded. If there's one that appeals to you, We'd love help either funding a case or, or spreading the word or, or, or whatever you feel inclined to do. And, um, and I appreciate you guys having me. We wanted to speak about the bone fragments that have been discovered on Loon Mountain. First, what's your feelings on these bone fragments? From what I know, the location that they were found was partway up the mountain. I do know that they were buried and that it was in a construction project. They were burying conduit. That's about what I know. But as far as, you know, when or whatever, of course, no clue. But I think what we need to go back to is, you know, there's so much speculation on the Loon Mountain 3 and whoever they are. The biggest thing with this whole thing is, well, like, you know, Mora was taken in February. At least that's what we believe. So if indeed this is Mora or whoever's body it it is, was more than likely put there during some construction project at Loon Mountain. And over the years, I mean, Loon Mountain used to be nothing. I mean, there was nothing there. You know, they started with a ski area and the amount of condos that are at Loon Mountain now is in the thousands. So there's always construction going on there now. And I heard that construction that they're working on this new uh, lift building and whatever. Yeah, the Kank 8? Kank 8, yes. Yeah, after the Kangamangas. So that's the project that they're working on. Now, the positive note about that part is that if the police are really on top of this right now, they know exactly what was in that area at that time. They know what was built at that time. 
They know who the employees of Loon Mountain were. If there was a construction company there, they know who the employees of that construction company were. And they should be digging like crazy, no pun intended, to try and figure out any suspect. Now, like we say, there's rumors going around that these bones were really old. I know that one of the people that was there was a, um, the uh, project archaeologist was there. And it just so happens that this person is the same person that worked with the Murray family on the April 3rd dig at the Yellow House. If the perpetrators are out there, perpetrator, paper, you know, or plural, they know what's going on. You know I mean, they know that the bones have been found at Loon Mountain and they're, they got shit in their pants, most likely, you know, because of the things that are probably going on. Keeping it a secret is, you know, it's already out. So there is no keeping it a secret because if, the, if they are the perpetrators, they know what they did. They know it's more or they know whose body it is. And, you know, you look at it this way, if it was a construction company, let's say the company, company was from Connecticut or New York or Massachusetts, wherever, this body could be somebody from that state that was killed by somebody down there and they took the body up here to get rid of, you know, far away from the incident as possible. So that's kind of what I think. Um, and I do believe that, you know, like we're hearing that there was hair attached to the, to the skull. So that, and they say that that indicates that the bones are 20 years older or, or younger or less, or been under the ground 20 years or less. That's another positive sign. So it's not some, you know, especially halfway up a mountain, you don't bury a body halfway up a mountain if you're a farmer or just somebody, you know, just somebody that says, I, my, that's where my relative wanted to be buried. I don't see that happening. Now, the fact that they only found a skull and supposedly partial vertebrae at Loon Mountain is pretty damn interesting. This is a small area up here. Everybody kind of knows everybody, and especially if you're in the construction business. What's the likelihood that this could have been a, an, an accident and this person couldn't be retrieved or maybe they were alone or, you know, something like that, whether it was a construction worker or whether it was somebody who stumbled into something, hit their head and, and just, you know, what are the odds of that? To me, even saying that out loud feels pretty slim, but I just want to, I just want to like go through all the scenarios, I guess. I'm, I'm glad you said that it's pretty slim because that's the way I think that that would be. If there's maybe a half a percentage in my brain that that would be possible. I mean, yeah, you know, like when they built the Hoover Dam, you know, how many people did they lose when they built the Hoover Dam? You know, and I believe they were bodies that weren't recovered. But this is a, you know, this is a small mountain where, you know. And that was the Hoover Dam. <laughs> right. So, and if you've got somebody, you know, working on a construction site, you know, and you go, hey, how come uh, Fred's not at lunch today? I mean, you're going to be looking for Fred, you know, did he just get sick and quit, you know, did he sick of the job and quit and walk off? Or like you say, did something, something happen to him? I feel it's a nefarious situation is the best way I can put it. Because that, that, just other stuff doesn't make sense to me. Do you know, was this a wooded area? The only thing that I've heard, it is it was along the edge of the uh, ski trail near a, uh, a lift, on a lift line. You mentioned this discovery was made while the construction unit was burying conduit. Can you explain a little bit what that is? Um, and then how deep would you have to dig to bury that? Well, um, usually the frost line up here in northern New Hampshire um, and whatever, it's usually about three feet. So sometimes the frost will go down three feet, two and a half to three feet. So most places when they do work like this, they will dig a ditch that's four feet deep because you want to get below the frost line so that it does not like same thing with foundations and stuff. They, they want to go below that frost line so that the frost so that the frost. Um, when the frost comes in, does not heave the foundation, does not heave, you know, like say you put a, a uh, uh, what you call it, across your driveway or whatever, a, a, uh, a culvert because you got water problems. And a lot of times that culvert is only a couple feet deep to two feet deep because you can't go too deep because then you're too far below the, the grade of the where the water would be coming through, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. So like a lot of times with that situation, the frost will heave up that culvert and you have to redig out the culvert and rebury it again because the frost will just kind of move it around and cause it to cause bumps in your driveway underneath where that culvert is. And what they were doing is going from, I believe they were going from the building to the power source, whatever that is. And they were 
sorry to interrupt. This is an electrical conduit. Yeah, I, I would okay. suspect that it's electrical conduit. Um, and what they do is they dig down four feet, they put the conduit, they lay the conduit in the ground, and then they run the the lines through it, and that protects the lines from being damaged. And most likely, that's usually a depending on how many lines you get going through there. It could be a a two inch piece of uh, either PVC or sometimes they use metal, you know, like, uh, and those are all joined together, but it would all depend on the size of, you know, how many wires they get going from one place to the other. I'm going to say it's probably pretty good size, maybe a six inch, maybe, you know, bigger than that to accommodate a bunch of wires. And John, last thing on the, uh, rumors of balloon three, are these conflated rumors? Uh, I know there's a lot of rumors about this, uh, situation and, you know, I, I don't think it's all been reported accurately at all. It doesn't seem, um, it, but it's been reported as rumors. Is there some truth in there, in there somewhere? I have never figured that out. I personally have been conflicted myself over the years as to who the Loon Mountain 3 are. So I really don't know. 